Hello. Welcome to Bose Colonial Space. I'm Masood Raja. And today I'll briefly talk about a certain kind of noest postcolonial scholarship. A kind of scholarship that focuses on the imperial imperatives or the colonial imperatives without effacing the native or local agency. Because that's really important to keep in mind in our work. So let me elaborate a little. I've been reading a few dissertations, some from India, some from Pakistan. And what they end up being is sort of a catalog of colonial activities that completely control the native narrative or where every ill that has happened in India, Pakistan or elsewhere is attributed to the colonizers. Of course, they were responsible for so many ills. But there is a sense that comes out of these works as if the native people have no agency of their own, no knowledge of their own, no counter discourses of their own. And we know historically that those counter discourses were always there, political, semiotic, right? So what that means is that when you do your work as emerging scholars in post-colonial studies, remind yourself that you are not just giving a catalog of victimhood. You're pointing out the excesses of colonialism or the new imperial order in which we exist, but at the same time, you're not offering the post-colonies or your native cultures as completely passive, having no will of their own. Because then that reduces these complex cultures, these large nations and nation states to just passive recipients of all the imperatives of former colonizers and neoliberalism. So you have to nuance your argument. How do I do that? And that's not a perfect example. So I account for what is being mandated, for example, let's say by the IMF, by United States, by the European Union. How is it that they control the global economy, right? But then what I also suggest is the possibilities of resistance to it. Right? That knowledge comes from the World Social Forum, like people like Walden Bellow and others, Samir Amin. They are the ones who have theorized how the third world intellectuals and the third world economists and politicians need to constantly articulate their own specific point of view while being aware of the power of these institutions like IMF and others. So what I suggest to my students what they ought not to do is to simply offer a catalog of victimhood. Simply suggest that whatever is happening in Iran, in Iraq, in Pakistan is over-determined by United States and by the world powers. Because what that does is it takes away any agency or any claims to agency to the native people. So one aspect of then doing post-colonial work in today's world is to account for those narratives. What are people saying? What are they doing? How are they resisting these political and economic imperatives? And then articulate those as well. And then it becomes a response, right? That takes away, takes out this buried knowledge, so to speak, if we go by Foucault, and then juxtaposes it against the mainstream knowledge. Now, you know, like in, in scholarly works, even at the highest level, sometimes there are a lot of misreadings. For example, one of the biggest charges against Edward Said after Orientalism came out was 
that the natives have no voice in it. They come out as a construct of a discourse called Orientalism. Now, I think it's a misreading of Said because in the introduction he clearly states that the project, this book and its project is to articulate how a discourse called Orientalism creates its objects in the Orient. When you go to his other works, Cultural Imperialism, his works on Palestine, we already know that he is talking about resistance. He is talking about how the native cultures and the native people did resist colonizers and still continue to do so. So in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, you can dismiss it, is good post-colonial scholarship won't just be, oh, America is doing this, Britain is doing this, France is doing this. We know they, are, they have a lot of power in the world. But not offering yourself, your native cultures, as completely passive. If they are being overpowered, are there any local elite whose interests are aligned with the international order? And if they are, are there any popular movements against them? Are there people who are coming together and saying, well, you know, government isn't doing much for us. Let's form a collective. Let's help each other. Then you can also trace the rise of fundamentalist organizations. How do then they reach people, right? Because of these global imperatives. So the idea is to not offer your constituency, your group, as completely silenced. Because then you're admitting that you have no voice. Uh, for example, I read a lot of uh, post 9-11 texts, works about post September 11. And most of the times, you know, there are instances of Islamophobia and all. But what I don't see in them is, one, how did the Muslim cope with it? Or how do they cope with it? And two, did they have allies? Were there people who stood up and said, no, Muslims are equally as American as anyone else. Muslims are equally as Canadian as anyone else because there needs to be an accounting for that as well, right? Then it's a nuanced scholarship. And then it's a scholarship where you are trying to theorize how to undo this, right? But also, if there are some enlightened critiques of what is being done by certain segments of the Islamic culture, what is happening, then take those critiques into account because that should allow you to reflect on what's happening. Right. So these are some of my tentative thoughts. I just finished reading something on this topic. So remember, colonizers were never able to completely overwrite the native cultures. There were always resistances. There are always resistances even now. And our job as post-colonial scholars is to walk that fine balance where we point out the pernicious impact of colonialism and the harmful impact of the current neoliberal order but at the same time, we don't just want to represent people in the post colonies as pure victims. We have to research and articulate what forms of resistances are they mounting, what forms of counter arguments are emerging, what forms of counter systems of governance, economics, politics are emerging because that's also part of post-colonial studies. So these are some thoughts. I hope they are useful to you. I hope they are useful to the scholars whose work I've been reading. And I would love to hear your thoughts, share them with me. And uh, I would love to respond to any questions that you have. Now, uh, on a separate note, uh, I am in the process of transition. I'll be moving 
from Texas to West Virginia pretty soon. So there might be a very long break in between before I can record anything useful, but I'll try my best to continue posting it. You can follow me and watch the new developments, of course, in our Facebook group, which is called Postcolonial Space, or on my Facebook page, which is called Dr. Masood Raja, uh, which is about my new venture, what I'll be doing as a life coach and educational consultant. I would love to have your support there as well. Thank you so much. I hope you're taking care of each other, and I will now see you next time. Until then, as always, peace and love.